man, if you're not awake now, I don't know what to tell you. You need to go get a Monster Energy drink. <coughs> Is everyone recuperated from Christmas yet? Ready for the new year of 2020? Neither am I. <laughs> Do you realize that it is the end of another decade in 2000? Do you remember two decades ago the hysterics behind Y2K? I'm glad that God is sovereign over us and not the experts. But since God's granted us a little more time on earth, I wanted to encourage you towards a New Year's resolution for 2020 and beyond. During this Advent season in 2019, we've dissected the Old Testament text of Ezekiel through the lens of Advent's hope, faith, peace, and joy. And each of those represented through the lighting of a candle as a reminder every week of December for Jesus' birth, His life, His resurrection, but most importantly, His return. Today, the final candle was lit to recognize Jesus' birthday of December 25th. It's this final candle that separates Christianity from all other religions. All other religions base an eternal destination on the amount of works by a follower. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one or nothing comes to the Father except through the salvation of Jesus Christ. Salvation from eternal condemnation because of our sin. It isn't geographically or racially or politically or economically influenced. Jesus came for the Jew and the Gentile. Because God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. That whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. God didn't send His Son to condemn the world. But in order that the world might be saved through Him. God loved the world. He gave His only Son. Not an angel or anything else. He gave His Son. And He did it solely. He didn't do it solely for the Israelites did it for the Gentiles, us, too. God sent His Son to save it, not condemn it. This is the case. We must be missing something because we are continuously identified with condemnation and exclusion. In my opinion, it centers around one word within the text we will read today and our total misunderstanding of it. I've always stated throughout my pastorate that words matter. This word matters for salvation. This word matters for evangelism. This word matters for see we bay. This word is love. It's one of the most abused words in our world today. I love Tennessee football. I love a T-bone steak with lobster mac and cheese. I love Lindsay, Emma, and Eli. I love taking a nap. Just in these short statements, there are so many different interpretations of my love for some things and people. But we shouldn't be surprised by that. Because the world defines love as first a strong affection for another arising out of kinship or personal ties. Number two, an attraction based on sexual desire. Number three, affection based on admiration, benevolence, or common interests, warm attachment, enthusiasm, or devotion. And then lastly, the object of attachment devotion or admiration, unselfish, loyal, and benevolent concern for the good of another. The most biblically accurate definition in all of these is ranked as the dead last. But let's be honest with each other. Although the world may define love in these ways, we probably prioritize them in the same way. 
even as professing children of God. So as we begin to march towards 2020, I want each of us to change our self-centered, secular perception of love towards a godly, soul-fulfilling love for ourselves and each other. In order to do that, we must identify the true source of love. We must identify the characteristics of living within this love. And then we have to accept those responsibilities of godly love. Now, don't check out of this sermon at all because it is one of the most important sermons for our lives and the church of Siwi Bay. You can take a nap next week. <laughs> Stay awake today. Because when we get this right, when we get this so focused and right, there is absolutely nothing in this world that can stop us. But if we get it wrong, we'll die just like every other church within this community doesn't grasp the love of God. I'd ask you to open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4 verses 7 through 21. 1 John's located in the New Testament, located between 2 Peter and 2 John. If you go to the very end of the last book of the Bible, Revelation, and you just track to the left four books, you'll land right on 1 John. John He's been considered the apostle of love. Because love appears over 30 times within chapter 4 and chapter 5 of this text. In multiple verses of the Gospel of John, he is referred to as the one whom Jesus loved. Jesus didn't love any of the others any less, but John was so affected by the immense love and relationship that he had with Jesus, that he wanted to highlight that love of him. I want that too. Don't you? I want to have it so much that others, whether a believer or non-believer, see it through my interaction with him. That there is no difference in how I interact with each of you than someone out on the street. That's the kind of godly love that I want reflected in my words and my deeds. So let's jump into 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another. For God, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Brings me to your first sermon. Then. The true source of love. Love comes from God and God alone. Now, although that might not be profound to you, we don't really cling to this application through our lives. Pardon my redneck reference here, but many of you will appreciate it. It's more like Johnny Lee's song. I was looking for love in all the wrong places. Looking for love in too many faces. Searching their eyes. Looking for traces of what I'm dreaming of. Hoping to find a friend and a lover. I'll bless the day I discover another heart looking for love. Y'all are going to go to that guy. Just she's looking for love. Hey, whatever works. Whatever works. We may be looking for love from a parent and not getting it. We may be looking for love from a spouse, a significant other as well as through a bottle, alcohol, or a prescription drug, or an illegal one. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15-17 through 17 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. 
If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. We have even sought love within church buildings and have been disappointed or even hurt by that lack of love. We forget that this place, this building, holds a room full of sinful people in desperate need of repentance, forgiveness, and sanctification. The love of the church comes from Christ alone. The love of a church comes from Christ alone. If we have the love from God, fellowship within these walls is better Worship within these walls is better. Discipling each other outside these walls is better. And evangelism of His gospel outside these walls is miraculous. But does the all and all community see Seaweed Bay this way? When they see Seaweed Bay, or when they see one of us who represent God's church at Seaweed Bay, do they see that? Or are we no different than in what Second in Timothy describes in 2 Timothy chapter 3? But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with such people. I don't want to have a form of godliness but deny its power. Do you? It's the reason that so many churches are dying. Especially in rural communities lost the love of God. And in order to combat this sin, we must first acknowledge our sin that God is not a concierge idol for our own selfish desires. We don't show up on Sundays to ask God for something. We don't sit down like last Saturday night between 11 and 12 o'clock and get on our knees and pray that the football rolls a certain way for whichever team. I'm not talking about Clemson fans. I'm talking about oh the other teams. <laughs> Hebrews 13 says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, Never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. Look, we can't turn back history and repeat things. We don't want to repeat things. We need to hear Hebrews 13 clearly when it says, be content with what you have. God gave it to you. Especially during this Christmas season. And our content in life is really just a measure of our understanding of the value of our salvation and raising it higher than all the pleasures that this world can throw at us combined. Salvation of Jesus Christ between anything and everything you could ever have. Salvation is far greater. Brings me to our next sermon. I can love because God loves me. I can love and I can know love and I can share love because God loves me. Follow with me in verses 4 through 9 of 1 John. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. And in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Verse 10 is awesome. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us. 
He loved us so much that He gave His own Son. He's not just talking about loving us. He does it. There's this emptiness in chasing love through the world. Offerings about love. You can chase it and there's that high, but once you reach your destination, it doesn't feel so great. Some people have been mistreated, abused, abandoned, betrayed, lied, and deeply wounded in the name of love. And at the end of it all, we ask, can anyone love me? And the answer is, yes! It's Jesus Christ! He is the only way and the only person who will love you. It is repeated twice in this passage just to reassure any of us. Uh, he loved us even when we did not love Him. He loved us even when we didn't love Him. And He demonstrated His love by sending His Son. Paul writes in Romans 5.8, But God shows His love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Propitiation, which is an awesome scrabble word, is only used four times in the New Testament. And it means to turn away the wrath of God by means of an offering. We've read plenty of Old Testament and understand that during Old Testament times, there were many offerings to make to God at the temple through the priests, including a sin offering. This all changed through Jesus Christ. God made the satisfaction, the atonement, as He offered Himself in His Son. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says, God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. Watched it all the way. Past, present, future. One of my favorite pastors and theologians, Tim Keller says, the gospel is that Jesus lived the life you should have lived, and He died the death you should have died in your place. So God can receive you not for your record and sake, but for the, His record and sake. <clears throat> Hear that again. This is the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus lived the life that you should have lived, and He died the death that you should have died in your place. So God can receive you, not for your record, not for your deeds, not for your words, but for Jesus' record and sake. As a professed follower of Jesus Christ, do we really have that mentality? Do we really have that mentality? We are basically life-sentenced inmates out on parole by the mercy and deep love of God through His Son. <clears throat> Every morning should begin with this. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty, I am free at last. Every morning. You are just an inmate on parole by the grace of Jesus Christ. And that freedom should just move us to invite others to hear about Jesus through our own testimony and worshiping here at Seaweed Bay. It should move. You shouldn't be. You could not hold yourself back from inviting others to know about Jesus Christ. And you shouldn't hold yourself back by whatever history you had to show them the future that Jesus gave you. If anyone within this place doesn't have that freedom today. I encourage you to come forward and be released from the prison of sin. No one can get their things right first and then meet Jesus. That's not how it works because you will try until your death and fail. He is the only one who loves you for who you are right now. For the unspoken stuff that none of your friends or family member or even outsiders know. He loves you right now. He's telling you to come forward. And He'll get the other things straightened out for you. 
You have not experienced a love, nor can you love at all until Jesus Christ is in your life. You can't. It comes from God. It leads me to your next sermon there. I can love because God lives in me. Not only because He loves me, but He lives in me. Here verses 11 through 21. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us. And His love is perfected in us. And by this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. <coughs> and whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Amen. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence of the, for the day of judgment. Because as he is so, also are we in this world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because He first loved us. Yes. And if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. Amen. For he does not love his brother whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. Amen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. I want you to understand the brother part. You don't get along with your brothers and sisters every day either. They make you angry. I mean, may, let, let, let's, maybe not within our family, but we know others who get in disagreements. you got to love them too. This text is just saturated with the descriptions of a triune God in the persons of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it also shows that we don't get a little bit of God upon our salvation through Jesus Christ. Jesus taught and lived out, pouring out the Holy Spirit upon His disciples when He ascended on the day of Pentecost. And we receive that same Spirit which leads and guides and directs us in our everyday lives. You don't get 2%, you don't get 5%, you get 100 when you come to Christ, the Spirit lives in you. John 14, 23 says, Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them. And we will come to them and make our home with them. Hey, ain't, ain't no maybe. He's coming. He's with you. Always. <clears throat> Reside in me. Father, and make yourself comfortable, God Almighty. Allow others to see you living within me. May your love and mercy be shown in all of my words and all of my deeds. And may we all be so bold as in Romans 8, verses 35 through 39. This is about the fight, and I want you to hear it. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Who shall separate us? No one. Stuff is going to hit the fan. 
But we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Not just conquerors. We are more than conquerors through the Son of God. I know it's hard. Trust me. As your pastor, I know it's hard. But that doesn't give me a right to stop trying. Loving others doesn't mean condemning sinful behavior, nor does it mean condoning sinful behavior. Let me... I want you to hear that very clearly. Loving others doesn't mean condemning sinful behavior, nor does it mean condoning it either. <clears throat> this is what God's love means. If we love others, we go to those who may not want us there. We share our testimony to those that may not want to hear it. We even love those who may hate and even kill us for it. Ephesians 4 speaks it this way on how we love others and neither condemn nor condone. It says instead, speaking the truth in love. Hear that clearly. Speaking the truth in love. We will grow to become in every respect a mature body of Him who is the head that is Christ. He's talking to a church here. Believe it or not, churches argued amongst themselves. From Him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, meaning the people, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. He doesn't say one part is better than the other. He doesn't say that the pastor, Paul, who's leading these people, are better than the other. He says each person does its work. Here's a newsflash. Church people, including the pastor, mess up royally. I mean, phenomenally. Epically. But Romans 12 says, Be devoted to one another in love and honor one another above yourselves. That means taking it on the chin sometimes when you screwed up and going and, and getting an apology. And when you get that apology, you did your share to seek reconciliation. 1 Peter, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Not just a couple, a multitude of sins. So as your pastor and speaking truth and love, I say this delicately. Let's get off our high horses and get on our knees and wash each other's feet for repentance, for forgiveness, and mercy. We are no better than the other and we are just as sinful as the other. But our role is to walk together to the highway of heaven and seek God together. That very act of seeking God repentance and forgiveness and mercy among each other will free us from our sin as well as separate Seaweed Bay as a place for reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 14 says, That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ. God making His appeal through us. Do you see yourselves as an ambassador of Christ? You better. As Tony Evans states in his book, Kingdom Man, when we get up in the morning, the devil and his army should be saying, oh no, he's up. That's <laughs> what they should say about the church. Oh no, they're up. I want each of us to memorize verses 18 and 19 of our main text. There is no fear in love. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because He first loved us. Memorize that verse and carry it through you in 2020. If we could just find the courage 
and courage to reclaim love in the name of God, He'll use us to break down so many barriers of hate and injustice and inequality within our community. This church and community would see a revival unlike any other. This week's text has been so good to prepare us for our in-depth study of the book of Acts, which begins next week. The followers of Jesus Christ are <clears throat> devastated by His death and worried about their own lives afterward. But then He came back. His resurrection changed their lives forever. And their love for Him spread His gospel throughout the Roman Empire and the rest of the world. We wouldn't be standing here without their love for Him. His blessing on their love for Him turned a despised outside religion to the most recognized faith in the entire world. God wants to do that again. And He wants to do it again right here at His church at CBA. And 2020 is the year of the love for our Savior. Let's ring in the new year of Jesus Christ. Let's proclaim salvation from seaweed to Santee. And reclaim unity among our families and community for the kingdom of God. Let's pray.